Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I had lived in my beach house for over 20 years. It was a cherished family home that my grandparents had built back in the 1960s. Some of my best childhood memories were made running around on the beach right outside, building sandcastles and splashing in the waves. When my grandparents passed away, they left the house to me. It was a huge blessing since I didn't have the means to buy a home, especially not a waterfront property in such a desirable area. I did some renovations on the place, while still preserving its original charm and character. The light blue walls and white trim had remained unchanged for decades. Living so close to the water was a dream come true. I could take a short stroll down my sandy pathway and dive right into the ocean whenever I wanted. At night I would sit out on the deck and listen to the soothing sound of the waves rolling in. This was my little slice of paradise. That is, until Karen moved in next door. Right from the start, she rubbed me the wrong way with her entitled attitude. The day she moved in, she marched right over and announced that she would be throwing loud parties well into the night, so I should just deal with it. When I politely asked her to keep the noise down at a reasonable hour, she went off about how I was interfering with her right to have fun in her own home. Things only escalated from there. Karen began tossing her trash into my yard, claiming it was too far for her to walk to the curb. She would let her rambunctious dogs run wild through my garden, tearing up the flower beds I had painstakingly tended to. I approached her nicely about these issues, but she always had some excuse or flipped the situation around on me somehow. Uh, I started avoiding her at all costs. I even put up a privacy fence on the property line to keep her away from my side of the yard. This seemed to offend Karen greatly, though I couldn't understand why. It was my property and my fence. I wasn't telling her what to do on her land. One Saturday morning, I was out on my deck enjoying my coffee and taking in the seaside view. The sound of angry footsteps in the sand drew my attention. Karen was stomping her way up to my house, waving papers in her hand. What are you still doing here? She demanded. This is my property now. Get out! I stared at her, completely perplexed. What on earth are you talking about, Karen? This has been my family's house for over 50 years. Not anymore, she huffed. I bought this place fair and square at an estate sale last week. She shoved the papers in my face. I scanned the documents but didn't recognize the names of the supposed owners who had sold the estate. Karen, I have no idea who these people are, I said, but this is my house. Now please get off my property. Karen's face turned beet red. How dare you, she screamed. I paid good money for this. I even got a great deal because those owners were desperate to sell, but now it's mine and I'm kicking you out. I took a deep breath, trying to remain calm. Let's go down to the county clerk's office and sort this out, okay? I have all the deeds and paperwork proving my ownership. Karen refused to listen. She began taking photos of my house, threatening to send them to her lawyer. I'd finally had enough of her absurd behavior. I called the police to report her for trespassing. The police arrived and I presented my paperwork, complete with stamps and seals demonstrating my lawful ownership. Karen reluctantly showed the officers her supposed estate sale documents. But it only took one quick check for the police to determine they were fake. The people who allegedly sold the estate didn't even exist. Karen's face went pale when the police put her in handcuffs for fraud and attempted theft. As the officers led her away, she was screaming that I was the real scammer and she would make me pay. I thanked the professionals for their help in dealing with this deranged woman. Once Karen was safely in a squad car, the gravity of the situation sank in. She had been planning to steal my precious family home. Knowing how unhinged she was, I decided to take legal action and file a restraining order to keep her away once and for all. The judge easily granted my request based on Karen's outrageous behavior. These days, I can once again relax and enjoy my charming beach house without that pest of a woman making trouble. The view of the ocean is as serene and calming as ever. I suppose the one good thing Karen did was make me appreciate this peaceful slice of paradise even more. I won't let anything jeopardize my little refuge by the sea again. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Senior year of high school, I was taking a plane to visit my grandma. The flight went from Baltimore to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Vegas, then Vegas to Boise. The flight from Baltimore was almost empty, and since I was on Southwest, I could choose my own seat. 
I stayed on the same plane until Vegas. I selected the last row of the plane by the window, put my earbuds in, and took a nap until Pittsburgh. When the plane landed, I went to the bathroom while people were boarding. To save my spot, I left my backpack in my seat and put my jacket on the seat before leaving. When I returned, I noticed that a pregnant lady was sitting in my seat, with her husband in the aisle seat. My jacket was thrown on the ground in the aisle with my backpack underneath it containing my laptop. Kind of annoyed, I pointed out that I was previously sitting in the window seat and wanted to know if I could have my seat back. Can't you see that I am pregnant and need this seat? She said aggressively. I looked at the husband and asked if he could please scoot over and sit next to his wife. This guy looked me in the eyes and said, Sorry, but we are allowed to choose our own seats, and I chose the aisle seat. Being a high school senior, I wasn't that big of a guy, but I was still not happy to be sitting in the center seat. Realizing that this was a losing argument and I wasn't going to get any leverage over this lady, I decided to grit my teeth and bear it. I collected my stuff and moved into the middle seat. The second I sat down, the lady said, You can't have your backpack in your seat. You're going to have to find a place to put it. I'm just going to put it under my seat, I responded. Where am I going to put my feet then, she responded. I don't know, not under my seat. I retorted. Growing up, I swore more than most people and really only watched what I said when at school. Suddenly, I felt someone grab my collar. The husband pulled me inches from his face and said, Don't use that language towards my wife or the baby. You will say you're sorry. I was shocked. Not only was this guy grabbing me in public, but at the time I was only 17 and still considered a minor. But not wanting to make a big deal out of this, I gave the most half-hearted, I'm sorry to the woman, and put my earbuds in as the flight was getting ready to take off. While taxiing, the lady kept trying to get my attention by yelling in my ear and snapping her fingers inches in front of my face, before she finally pulled my earbuds out. You need to turn your electronic off during takeoff, she said. Now, my dad was a pilot for 30 years, and he confirmed that electronics don't interfere with communications. It is mostly a formality so that people pay attention to the emergency instructions. So I ignored her since we were literally less than a minute from taking off. In rage, she spammed the flight attendant button, and one came over. We also had to hold takeoff until this issue was resolved. The flight attendant ran over and asked what was wrong, expecting an emergency. He won't turn off his electronics before flight. He is trying to kill us, she exclaimed. Realizing everyone was staring at us when the flight attendant asked me to turn it off, I obliged. After I turned it off, she started to lecture me about how she was right and I was wrong, rubbing in how the flight attendant proved her right. So the flight was in the air, and when the intercom told us we could use electronics, I put my earbuds in and cranked up the volume. About five minutes into the flight, I felt aggravated tapping on my shoulder. I turned and looked at the woman. You need to turn that down. It is bad for the baby, she said. While I was listening to the music louder than usual, it still wasn't loud enough that an unborn baby could hear and understand. Shocked, I responded with, no, but the second she reached for the flight attendant button, I said that I would. I did the trick where you turn your volume down twice and then up once so that it looks like you turned it down three times. Better? I asked. More, she responded, so I went down one more. Before I could put my earbuds in, she said, It is proper etiquette to talk to people you're sitting next to. I just ignored her. I sat back and tried to close my eyes, and amazingly, it worked. I fell asleep for about an hour. It was a five-hour flight. When I woke up, this woman had her foot on my backpack with my laptop in it. I adjusted my foot so that it would be uncomfortable for her to continue keeping her feet where they were. She immediately stood up, and I thought she was going to yell given her tendency to overreact but it turns out she was just getting up to go to the bathroom. She got past me and her husband when a brilliant idea popped into my head. The second she stepped into the bathroom, I got ready to get up and move my stuff over to the window seat. As I grabbed my backpack and shifted my momentum over, I felt a hand grab me. I did not take into account the husband. You are not taking my wife's seat, he said. Sir, I have to warn you that you are grabbing a minor, and if I feel like it at any second, I could claim that you are attacking me or have made sexual advances on me, I responded as he let go, and I moved back to the seat I had before. When she got back, she was furious, demanding that I move seats now to the point that the flight attendant came over to see what was going on. This time, she sided with me. 
When she asked her husband to make me move, I looked him dead in the eyes, and he went back to reading his book. She ended up sitting in the middle seat, very angry. Thankfully, I moved seats because she was up and down in her seat, having to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes. That was pretty much the rest of the flight, except how she intercepted my bag of pretzels when the drink cart came. In response, I closed the shade to the window as we started to land at the Las Vegas airport. Once off the plane, I went to Burger King to get a drink and some food. Then I got to my next gate and found the last seat. I scarfed down my fries and burger, walked across the hall, literally ten feet from my seat, to throw away my garbage. And when I turned to go back to my seat, I saw the same lady now sitting in the seat where I had my bag. She had moved it to the floor right in front of her, and then she shot me this smug grin, thinking she had won. Somewhat defeated by losing two seats to this lady, losing sleep, and my patience, it was time for action. I walked over to her to gather my things, and as I got to her, I looked her dead in the eyes, raised my right hand out, fingers spread, and hovered it right over her stomach. I looked down at my hand, then back at her eyes. I just cursed your baby, I said, straight-faced turned around 180, walked across the hall, and sat down on the floor staring at her intensely. Now, I don't believe in curses, nor do I think I have the ability to place a curse. But this lady believed it. Her face was left expressionless, and she just started weeping to herself as I sat and watched. When her husband came over to see what was wrong and she told him, he instantly stormed over to me, knocked the drink out of my hand, grabbed me by the collar, and got right in my face. Listen here, you little crap! He got out before security guards grabbed the man and detained him. The FAA doesn't mess around with who they hire. One guard asked me why this guy was angry, and I said that his wife had taken my seat, and I made a comment under my breath, and he got upset with me. The officer asked for my name and identification, and when he saw that I was a minor, he asked if I wanted to press charges, and I told him yes, but that I also didn't want to miss my flight. He understood and let me go then informed the Southwest Airline gate attendant to please keep track of me in case we needed more information. This meant that I got to board early and chose the first seat I could, an aisle seat, to see if this lady would get on the plane. Since she was sitting in the same gate as my flight, she never got on the plane, and it took off. Halfway through the flight, the flight attendant asked me if I had put a curse on the baby, and I responded with, I don't know magic. Twenty minutes later, the flight attendant told me that unfortunately, I would not be able to press charges on them due to being a minor, but that they had missed their flight and would have to buy a new ticket to their final destination with another airline. With five words, I cost this horrible woman and her abusive husband around $500. The next one is a petty revenge story. I'm a truck driver and I deliver goods to a chain of stores. Not all the managers are very nice. This time I had to deal with a total Karen for the second time. My job is to get the pallet inside the store just across the threshold and that's it. Most ask us to put it somewhere specific and usually we are willing. This woman is no exception. She asked if I would put the pallets around the corner a few feet away from the door. I did this and the first one got picked up by her staff. I placed the second one in that spot and the third just over the threshold because that's the only available space left. I can only get three pallets on the hydraulic lift, so I went to get another set. I returned after a few minutes, and the last pallet was still there. Karen told me she would only pick it up if I would set it around the corner because she couldn't get to it there. A clear lie, since she had tried something like that before. It's a total power play on her part, getting me to do something she should do herself, even if it takes me three times longer. So I grabbed her pallet lift and placed it under the pallet. See, looks fine to me, please just work with me, and that's how the argument started. Just work with her drivers, and not against them. She wouldn't have a problem with people not wanting to do extras for her. She started name-calling and gave me the finger. I just left everything as it was and drove off, leaving her to get the other three pallets from outside up the slope into the store. I didn't bother asking her to sign the papers because of obvious reasons. No one treats me like that and gets away with it. I hope I don't get into serious trouble. This happened a few hours ago, and my employer has yet to read my email about it. Ten-tenths would do it again, though. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I'm a senior construction superintendent in the DFW area. The project I'm currently on is a 13-acre site, right in the middle of an extremely affluent area to the north of Dallas. 
Three weeks ago, a city inspector that we'll call Joe came into the site office and said that they had received a complaint about a sprinkler or soaker line being damaged during excavation for the fire lane. He, my landscaper, and I went to investigate and discovered where a small fitting had blown out of the line. The landscaper repaired it, and I went up to knock on the door to explain the issue and inform them of the repair. I got no answer at the door, so I left a card and a note asking them to call me. They never did. A week later, Joe came in and mentioned that they'd reached out again about the noise from equipment, which is odd, because anyone with heavy equipment is currently working on the other end of the property. I again went to speak with them, got no answer at the door, and left a card again. Yesterday, Joe walked in to tell me that they're complaining about our construction fence being on their property and killing their grass. The fence is 12 from their fence, and our specs call for it to be a minimum of 15 from the property line. So I pulled up our CAD files on the survey plat to make sure we have it placed exactly, and I realized that their wood fence is 4 onto our property. Their house is about 14 inches onto our property. During all of this, I received an email from the city asking me to place the construction fence squarely on our property line. The email was sent to me, the apparent homeowner, Joe, and my project manager. I brought the surveyors back out yesterday to pinpoint our property corners and give us some 10 uh, offsets, reference points 10 to east of the property line for line of sight, to measure from. I knocked on the homeowner's door again and got no answer, even though there were cars in the driveway. Fast forward to this morning, my fence crew showed up, and they began moving the fence onto the property line, which takes 31 inches, 2 feet, 7 inches, of their driveway, and 18 of the road where it ends at the property, previously a cul-de-sac. The client finally reached out, or more accurately, came to the site office in a huff. I explained the issue, showed him the plat, and he left with some unkind words flowing from him, like diesel exhaust on a steep incline. I put a pause on the fence relocation just to soothe the wound. My PM called him, I called the city right-of-way, row, engineer, and our client. We set up a meeting that just ended. He claimed that our plat was wrong, but the engineer and everyone else disagreed. The back and forth went on long enough for the client, who is an extremely laid-back and quiet gentleman, to finally speak up and basically say, we're just going to go ahead and sell you the property you've stolen at current market value plus 10%. In this area, that's not cheap. If that's not acceptable, we'll just have you move your fence, cut out your driveway, and use the east side of your home for advertisement. Or you can back off, let these guys work, and we'll give you lifetime use of the area you currently occupy, so long as there's no more hassling of any kind. The guy asked me if we'd move the fence back out, and I told him no. I agreed to take it off his driveway, but the street and green space belonged to us. We only did what he asked us to do. The engineer who asked me to move it agreed. So, there it is, the story again, the fallout and conclusion. The next one is an entitled people story. Yesterday, I was on a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina, to Phoenix, Arizona, which is in the U.S. for y'all. I am disabled due to a back issue, but it doesn't really matter. For context, that's why I am right up front. I am in the front row. Now, on most airlines, the front row is considered first class, but this particular airline doesn't have seating arrangements. It's all about the number on your boarding pass. The first bin is for those of us in the front rows to put our purses or backpacks because we can't put them under the seat in front of us. This woman gets on pretty close to last and starts shoving her stuff on top of everyone else's things in the first bin, even though it's full. Mind you, there is plenty of room in the bin right behind the first one. Me. Me, entitled passenger, EP. Me. Ma'am, you are shoving your purse into my backpack and my iPad is in there, as are my headphones. Could you please stop? EP. Well, you shouldn't have your stuff in there. Why aren't you holding them? Me. Because we aren't allowed to have them on our lap until after we take off. They already announced it. There is plenty of room for your purse and bag in the bin right behind you. EP. Mmm. No, I don't want my bag way back there. Me. It's literally right next to that one, and you wouldn't have your stuff all over my backpack. EP. Nope, not moving it. Cue my pettiness. As soon as we took off, I made sure to get up and get my headphones. Me. Here you go, ma'am. Can you hold your purse while I get my headphones? Me. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you hold your purse while I get my iPad? Me. 
Excuse me, ma'am. Can you hold your purse while I get my lip gloss? Me. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you hold your purse while I put my headphones away and get my earbuds? I made about ten trips getting into my backpack just to annoy her because she refused to be a decent person. She was giving me the stink eye after about the third time, but I didn't care. You don't care about being a decent person. I don't care about you having a nice flight. All the passengers around me caught on to what I was doing pretty quickly and giggled every single time I unbuckled my seatbelt. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Hopefully this will teach this woman not to be so entitled, but I doubt it. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.